Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Biblical Perspective. It's the Saturday before Easter 2022. It's a time of great celebration across the Christian community, in all the world for that matter. But today we're going to talk about what happens when some really negative things happen. I hope you're planning on celebrating somewhere this weekend. If you're close to Winsboro, South Carolina, come join us for the community Easter sunrise service on our front lawn at 7 in the morning and our regular service at 930 where we're going to be having the Easter musical entitled, let me grab the cover here for you, Living Hope. We'll be performing that. I get to both sing and narrate and present this uh, with our praise team and a lot of our volunteers. It's going to be a great time. So come join us at either 7 or 9.30 or both. We even have breakfast in between. But as you're celebrating Easter, what about some of the other issues we are facing? For the biblical perspective today, I could have covered so many because there's just so much going on in the world. But I want to talk to you about surviving the upcoming famine. Now, for some of you, you might be thinking, oh, you're talking to those of us who live in India or Africa or somewhere else, but certainly not the United States. Oh, no, I really believe that the folks in the United States will be the ones most blindsided by the events that are coming in the world. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that some very bad things would be happening as a part of his Olivet Discourse, and sometimes we miss these. In verse 7, he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Now, we tend to have an escapist mentality, especially that part of the Western church that believes in a pre-tribulational rapture. We tend to think, oh, that means we're going to avoid all these things. This is stuff that happens after Jesus raptures his church out, right? Well, now, how's that working for you when you see many of the signs and signals Jesus talked about coming to bear? And I think more of those are, are happening in front of our eyes. Don't think that these are all issues that are going to be popping up after the rapture of the church. And instead, when we look at this and Jesus says there will be famines in various places, various, so that, that's where we, we catch ourselves saying, yeah, but not here. <laughs> I mean, we're a breadbasket. Look, we're surrounded by farms. We've got, uh, especially here in South Carolina, we have great supplies. And, you know, even when they talk about shortages in some other places, we've got the food, folks. Now, let me caution you. Don't ever get to the point where you think you are invulnerable, where you cannot be hit by one of these events taking place in the world because even our farmers are starting to feel the pinch. Now what should we do about it? I'm going to give you some practical solutions at the end or this is the only way you can face this legitimately, but I want to call your attention to some of the things that are happening in the world today. The cover of the Epic Times this past week had this story, Preppers warn of hard times ahead as preparedness goes mainstream. You see, we always thought that the preppers were a little bit on the crazy side, preparing for the apocalypse, you know, the bad things that can happen that never do. And, and now as we see some of those events changing around the world, uh, a lot more people are becoming preppers themselves of all political persuasions. The article is by Alan Stein. It begins by saying, as the idea of food self-reliance goes mainstream, Texas-based food scientist and health ranger, podcaster Mike Adams, says now is the time to start prepping for nationwide food shortages and other, uh, other major events. With food production buckling under the weight of runaway inflation, skyrocketing food costs, and fertilizer shortages, much of what's in store for many people is already built in, he said. Now, we may not realize this, but as we're at the beginning of a planting season, and this is something that's gone back to the uh, farming days of my grandparents, Good Friday was always a signal. You don't plant until after Good Friday. The ground's not warm enough. You plant too early, your crops won't flourish. And there's something about the Easter season that makes us think it's time to start planting. Well, guess what? We now have the ultimate perfect storm of things that's going to make this season pretty bad. He goes on to write, the thing to really watch for is the food inflation. 
My position is we're going to see food riots in America before the end of this year. We're going to see flash mobs in grocery stores. What? What, what, what is he talking about? Is this really going to happen? Could this really happen in America? That's what he's claiming. He said grocery stores are going to respond with increased security and checkpoints. At some point, we're probably going to see an attempt to uh, at price controls and rationing. And not on everything, just certain types of things. It's almost certain that there will be an attempt to enforce the rationing with a vaccine passport app, maybe, that becomes a food rationing app, he told the Epic Times. Now, you know, I don't know if I believe it will go that far or not, but when you see the signals of what's actually happening in the world today, you can see that we're in trouble when it comes to our future food supplies. And that's hard to recognize when right now our local grocery stores seem to have plenty of everything. They had some great Easter sales this year. Man, we're just enjoying it. Some of you caught those hams for 99 cents a pound. Others uh, have caught even items that had been scarce at times, like ground beef on sale. You're like, oh, yay, look at some of the great fresh vegetables. Asparagus is on sale this week. And so, uh, you know, for many of us, we don't see the shortages yet. I was in Sam's the other day in Sam's Club, and I said, if you look around, you don't see shortages here, do you? I mean, they've got it stacked up as they always do, seems like to the ceiling in places. Oh, but friends, that's only a misnomer. You do not realize what's actually coming. As this article goes on to say, as a food scientist, Adams is a major proponent of clean, organically grown food, free of heavy metals, which he makes available through online sale of his uh, Ranger buckets. But the demand for his products has been extremely high since the COVID-19 lockdown began in 2020. He says it takes six to eight weeks on average to produce some 2,000 buckets, which typically now sell out within 20 to 30 minutes to three hours of his putting them out for sale. Look, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the demand for survival food in the United States has been on the increase among a number of national suppliers. Now, the supply chain in the U.S. continues to crumble, says Lori Hunt at Practical Preppers in South Carolina. She says more Americans are realizing it takes four trips to different home improvement stores for parts just to make home repairs instead of all their needs being in one store. And other things are making us realize how the supply chain is getting tight. For example, I, I noticed the article the other day that indicated that a starting truck driver for Walmart will now be paid $100,000 per year. Now, as like many baby boomers, I'm closing in on retirement and suddenly realizing that because of inflation and all the other shortages, I don't have enough money to retire on, even though it's staring me in the face. I'm thinking, wow, I could work a couple of years driving a truck for Walmart and make up the difference. <laughs> Did you ever think you would see $100,000 as the salary, the starting salary for a truck driver? because the supply chain is so tight these days and we've got to get not just our groceries but all of our supplies out to market and try to get them out there as quickly as efficiently as possible. Well, as we look at some of these issues, uh, strangely enough, there was another article in the Epic Times and it's entitled, Farmers Struggle with Increased Food Demands and Supply Chain Disruptions. It's a lengthy article that talks about the basis for some of these things that we're watching happen right in front of our face. For example, Russia is one of the world's largest suppliers of fertilizer, which was a part of the U.S. sanctions list until March the 24th when the Department of Treasury removed key agricultural items from the embargo because of critical shortages here. However, the move may prove ineffective as Russia's De Deputy Secretary of the country's Security Council, Council, Dmitry Medvedev, has announced on April the 1st that Moscow won't sell agricultural products to countries it deems as enemies, effectively weaponizing key commodities. In other, in other words, folks, if you think we're going to be able to buy this stuff from Russia as long as we are supporting Ukraine, all of a sudden, we get on the enemies list. 
they won't even sell us fertilizer anymore. Uh oh. Uh -uh. Now back to this. Prior to the Russia-Ukraine conflict or even the pandemic, it became apparent that there were weak links in the global food chain. And we've experienced some of those earlier in this century, 2007, but that's nothing compared to what we are facing right now. During an October investigation, Eric Sanmez, an associate professor of supply chain management and analysis at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, said that production challenges and supply chain disruptions are not going to dissipate. He explained that capacity limitations in the food supply chain exist from start to finish. And the disruptions to the agricultural supply chains are more apparent and more important compared to other supply chains. Yeah, you've got to eat, my friends. He goes on to say, on one side, we have a shortage of the food supply while people are looking for food. On the other, we have food actually rotting or going bad in containers in some parts of the world. He noted that labor shortages especially in fresh produce. Transportation problems and raw material shortages on the production end are at the core of the problems in attempting to ramp up food production in the wake of the pandemic. But the compounding effect of the Russia-Ukraine conflict isn't to be underestimated, especially in nations that already suffer food insecurity. Africa in particular and now I'm getting to a quote by Curtis Youngs, the Associate Director of the Center for Sustainable Rural Livelihoods at Iowa State University, right there in the middle of our agricultural blessing belt, almost I would call it. He says, look, Africa in particular has a heavy dependence on imported grains from Russia and Ukraine. To me, it's quite unsettling that a human decision to engage in war is affecting so many innocent people. Yeah, you know, I could go on reading this article, but from one end to the other, it's uh, it's a lot of doom and gloom about what's coming up as far as our own supply chains. If you're a farmer, you know what I'm talking about. The price of fertilizer that you can get your hands on, where it used to cost you, you know, to fertilize your thousand acres for production of food, used to cost you maybe $200. Now it's costing you $1,200 to $2,000 just for the fertilizer. On top of that, the machinery that you use requires diesel fuel. Guess what's gone through the roof? And where do you think the cost of these items is going to be made up? It's going to be made up by those who purchase the products. So from the wholesale to the retail level, prices are going to go up. And if you haven't already noticed, take a trip to the grocery store and everything is beginning to inch up more and more. Now, of course, I started in the grocery business myself, worked with the Winn-Dixie Corporation for 11 years, and so I, I seem to still be a little bit close to that, and I make a point of talking to the folks in the grocery stores that, I pay, that I'm a patron of. We, we feed so many kids in our, our after-school ministry, our church ministries and events, that I try to stay in touch. And as I'm talking with my friends in the grocery business, they're saying, Look, the weekly price changes are back up to levels that haven't been rivaled since the 1970s, and maybe they're even more now. Some items changing twice in one week. These prices are beginning to go through the roof, but because it's only a few cents here, a few cents there, we don't necessarily notice it. You may notice it in some items that jump quicker or have a bigger jump all at once, but you'll notice it all in your bottom line bill as these items continue to go through the roof. Now you may change your habits for a little while, say, oh, that's too expensive, I can't, I can't eat that this week, I'll eat something else. And you begin to shift slowly, but here's what happens, eventually it catches up with all of us, it hits us all in our pocketbooks and our dollars, as in the case of those of us in the United States, continue to buy less and less of those things that we need. Well, what should you be doing as a believer in Jesus Christ, a Christian who wants to address this problem? Well, there's some things that Christians have always done, and in some cases, you need to be thinking about doing right now if you're not already doing it. First of all, keep an emergency food supply. That's something that should be recognized 
with every good believing household and family. I realize some folks live from hand to mouth, literally, almost from God's hand to your mouth, and there's no room in between. But if you've got room to be putting aside some non-perishable food items, some of those that last a lot longer, please do that. It's been one of the things that I've shared with people for some time, that we should at least keep an emergency food supply of three months. If everything were to shut down, could you survive for three months with what's already in your house? And some folks would say, oh yeah, that's right, I've got a freezer full. And freezers are fine, but don't put everything in the freezer. Because if you think about it, if we have the kind of emergencies that result in power shutdowns, that food in your freezer you're going to have to prepare pretty quickly because it's going to spoil once it all falls out. So as we look at the options, it's great to be able to take those things that are canned and dried. And yes, if you can afford that uh, that prepper food that comes in the big buckets and you can put a supply of that on hand, go ahead and, and do so. But you know, some of that turns out to be pretty expensive when you look at the base cost of it. But do what you, do what you can. Make sure you, as a family, can feed your household for at least three months in the time of an extended emergency. How do you begin to start this if you don't have a, a, an extra cushion in your budget? Well, I love what Glenn Beck suggested. He said, look, if you're going to the store and you need one of something, go ahead and buy two or three and set those others aside. Begin the process. You may have a little time here before things get completely out of hand to set aside some of that food that's necessary in an emergency. But do something else. Secondly, rotate your pantry. Think like the person that works at the grocery store, or at least that should at the grocery store, rotate the food products so that when new product comes in, it's got a better date than that which is on the shelf. You take that which is older out, you put the other behind it so that the older product sells first. It's just a natural way to do business if you work in the grocery industry. But most, most of us don't think about that, our home pantries. And you've, you've had it happen. You're, you're cleaning out and you're digging back to the back of your pantry shelves and all of a sudden you find something and say, wow, how long has this been here? Well, it went out of date two and a half years ago. Oh, who knows? <laughs> and you end up throwing out food. Friends, we need to be careful not to waste. So friends, carefully rotate your food supplies. Pay attention to what's in your pantry so that you can get the most benefit out of it, especially as it becomes more expensive. And then finally, think about having that backyard garden. Maybe you have never done that before. Go ahead and give it a shot. Yes, it's that season. It's, it's, it's a day after Good Friday in South Carolina. We should be thinking about planting. And for many of the folks where I live, that's just, it's just normal to have at least some kind of backyard garden, a container garden, or something that allows you to raise some of your own food yourself. Uh, now please don't get the idea that, you know, for some of us it's like, well I don't know how to start any of this stuff from seed. I'll go down to my local gardening store, or I'll go down to Lowe's or somewhere else and I'll just buy plants that are already big. Have you noticed what they're costing these days? You want to see inflation? I mean, if you pay $20 for a tomato plant, how many tomatoes could you have purchased for $20 before you even get the price of the plant out of the way? Learn how to grow things from seed. I know it sounds like it's a little more difficult. Of course it is. Having to start some things inside, nurture those little plants so they get big enough to transplant and the like. But that's how you really save money in this process, not by buying your plants with fruit already hanging on them and saying, oh wow, look what I did. Uh, because that's what we're going to have to get back to if the food shortages start really popping up. Now for many of us who live in rural areas, we think we've got it made. I mean, all around us are farmers that raise cattle, that raise chickens, that raise pigs, that raise almost everything. Every kind of food source you can imagine back during the middle of the pandemic, we were worshiping outside, never missed a Sunday. And we had a couple of folks like Dan Radford, God bless you, and some others that would just show up and on the back of their pickup trucks would be watermelons, corn, tomatoes, all kinds of food that they would share with others. You'd think it'd make sense to come and 
have a little farmer's market in the churchyard and sell some of that stuff. No, usually people were just giving it away. So living in a place like this, I think we have an advantage to some of you that might be living in a high-rise apartment in a big urban area. You guys are really going to feel the pinch when the supply chains can't get food to you. So friends, recognize when Jesus said there will be famines, he never said, but if you live in Winsboro, South Carolina, you won't have one. You won't feel this. I think we're going to feel it all over the world. And one of the best ways you and I as believers in Jesus Christ can help during those times and be a source of blessing is for us to see that what Jesus said is coming is definitely going to happen because it is obvious we are living in the last days and you and I can prepare so that when these times come, not only will we be taken care of, but we may be able to take care of someone else. Well, that's enough for today's Biblical Perspective. Thanks for joining me today. Please, it is Easter Sunday weekend. Worship somewhere with someone, with God's people, and celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll see you again Monday, each and every week, as long as God allows us to stay on these airwaves as we wake up in His Word. God bless you.